Sanjay Sethi is the MD and CEO of Chalet Hotels, one of India's largest hotel and hospitality companies and part of the K Raheja group. I sat down with Sanjay to learn more about his professional journey and the business of Chalet Hotels. We covered a wide range of topics through the conversation. Sanjay was generous with his time and shared some wonderful anecdotes and incidents from his career. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Hi Sanjay, welcome to the Sensei Kujaku show. Thank you so much for coming on. Hi Krish, pleasure being here. Look forward to the conversation. It's difficult to talk to anyone in your industry and not talk about the last 3 3 and a half years. Your industry more than virtually any other industry has taken an absolute beating but has lived to tell the tale especially the large guys um so i just want to get your you know your take on the last 3 3 and a half years some things that you've learned from it and why if you do believe that chalet and just the industry as a whole has in many ways come out stronger so krish yeah clearly we had a very tumultuous time right uh, starting sometime in march of 2020 onwards uh, and uh, everyone had written off the industry to a large extent and no one's going to go back and stay in hotels anymore no one's going to work out of offices anymore and all of that um so the early part of the first couple of quarters were all about you know conserving conserving uh capital conserving uh making sure our people stay with us and all of that nine years that one needs to do and it was very important to keep the morale of the team high and i think that's what we worked on uh we also set up a very sharp uh, core strategy group to react to the very very volatile conditions at that point of time one had to remain agile and i think shaili and the team at shaili did a fantastic job to be able to deliver a uh, ebitda positive numbers every quarter for the four quarters that followed that um so which are helped us stay af- afloat over there we had to slow down some projects to conserve cap uh, capital at that point of time but they are all in back in full pace now um the turnaround was took us it took all of us by surprise uh way back in january of 22 when i was getting interviewed by whether it was tv channels or consultants i had a little more pessimistic view and i was very sure because i'd seen how things were panning out for the last 3 or 4 quarters that business travel will be back leisure will come back very strong um and i thought we'd probably start picking up pace on the business side of the travel by october 22 that was my estimate in january last year uh i was proven wrong because it came back faster than that and uh everyone who had written us off uh, not us i mean the industry off uh were taken by surprise uh, i would say some of them were shocked to see the industry come back so strong especially business travel um as we stand today uh, the domestic business travel is somewhere between 20 and 40% higher than the pre pandemic number so clearly come back very strong and it's not revenge travel as some people called it or short term recovery because it doesn't last for five quarters right uh so clearly india is traveling both for work and for pleasure and uh we see this now deeply ingrained into what will what the future holds for the hospitality industry going forward international travel has been slow to pick up and uh, it's only recently that we've seen air passenger traffic numbers align themselves with pre pandemic uh, uh travel Uh, but it's still not back full full speed so we see the headroom for growth for the industry here onwards coming largely by sharp growth in international inward travel you know every time i travel and i either go through the middle east any country in the middle east my heart burns because i think of the fact that if things had turned out differently india could have been that hub you know like everyone could be flying through india wherever they want to go in the world mm-hmm. but if you take the view that over the next 20 years india does in many ways become a hub for travel not just people coming to india but people transiting through for work leisure whatever the case may be that should prove to be a tremendous tailwind for not only hotels but just hospitality generally and of course airlines and all of that sure. um so i want to get i want to understand from you how you think about that decadal story and and what about that excites you I think uh, the the Indian government with this the the political side of the government and and the admin side of the government are all targeting to get there. Mm-hmm. Uh and with the will directed towards that direction I don't see any reason why we won't be able to create a larger travel hub not just for the airlines even for the uh, water 
uh, transportation. Uh, we see a lot of focus in the ports in India, for example. So clearly Del Delhi, Mumbai are getting developed as hub airports, uh, especially the second one in Mumbai and the second one in Delhi that's coming up or Jaipur. Uh, so I see that growing, uh, giving it that impetus. Uh, I see uh, a tremendous improvement on um, cruise tourism into India. And, and both these will create uh, the travel hub that you were talking about to a large extent. But you know, uh, uh, more than the international travel hub, what I'm really excited about is where the domestic uh, uh, travel is happening. It's just so much more better than what it was pre-pandemic. Indians have discovered India all over again. And to that extent, uh, we, we, we see a, a large boom, uh, given that the base is so large even a 10% growth on travel by the Indian population within India is going to be phenomenally high and a massive, massive upside for hospitality and tourism. Could you talk about your own professional experiences, you know, thing and, and, and lessons you've learned along the way? Krish, Sanjay Sethi as a person is your regular guy next door, uh, as far as my personal persona and being is concerned. My career uh, in hospitality started by accident. Uh, and actually it was my father who actually uh, shared the advertisement for hotel management course with me. And he said, why did you apply here? Seems to be an upcoming field. And I did. Uh, and quite by accident, again, not by intent. Uh, the reason I took up hotel management, because I got through, um, there were four hotel schools at that time in India, and there was a joint entrance. And I got Calcutta as my uh, college. And because I'd grown up in Calcutta, all my friends were there. That was primarily the reason at that point of time that drove me to join that course. So it wasn't any deep-rooted passion for hospitality. I think that developed later, uh, very naturally, but it developed very, uh, it did develop later. So I joined the hotel school, uh, did my hotel management, early, early part of my career was pretty patchy, especially the first couple of years. Small hotels, small companies, worked with them, uh, till I actually took a massive dive in my, my pay grade and my designation to literally restart my career uh, with a large hotel chain, the Taj at that time. Uh, how old were you when this happened? It was roughly 1991. By then I was 26, 25, 26, and then I better join Taj. But I'd put in three or four years yeah. in the industry. And I came back to Taj and literally restarted my career over there at the bottom of the pile. I mean, uh, I was hired as an assistant restaurant manager. That was an agreed uh, understanding between us, but when the le exact letter came, it said on training and probation. So in, it was a fancy name for a management training, okay. right? So I had to start at the bottom of the pile. Uh, but I did write off my first three, four years from a career perspective, but hold them in very strong view in terms of my found the foundation that those three, four years created for me. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a pretty fast track rise in touch after that. Mm -hmm. And by the age of uh, 29 or 30, I had my first independent assignment as the head of one of the Taj units, a small unit in Taj uh, Madurai. And at that point of time, I'd just come out of F&B into general management. And uh, within a few months, I was told to build or uh, add capacity to that. And I had no idea that the size of a brick is nine inches by four and a half inches. Uh, but I had to learn that on the job. Okay. Uh, computers had just about started operating in that part of the country. Uh, and I was asked to make a BOQ, BOQ, a budget, and present to the board for approval and I didn't know what a BOQ stood for. Uh, so there was no resources to Google this stuff. So I had to ask around, learn the job. Uh, I started, I got my first exposure into Excel and Word mm -hmm. at that point of time. So I would, once my secretary left, she was the only one who had a computer in the whole office. I would move to her seat and practice my Excel and Word skills. And that's how I learned how to make the BOQ and get my approvals and build the hotel block, which was a very interesting experience on its own. Passion is a very cliche word, but I would say passion and curiosity as a combination uh, is what put me on a fast track on career, on the career growth side. And the other thing that I think helped me was that I always uh, took on more than my pay grade allowed me to take on from a work perspective. And therefore the learning curve was very sharp during that process. I was actually learning the next job whilst I was starting the previous one uh, and doing justice to the current one also. From there onwards, I think I was very happy with the way the career grew. I spent two seven-year terms at the Taj. In 2006, I think the entrepreneurial bug was eating away at me. I said, I don't want to do something on my own. And when um, a fund from US reached out, mm -hmm. wanting to fund a uh, hospitality venture in the budget hotel space, mm -hmm. I sort of put my hand up uh, and uh, sort of quit from Taj 
and set up a, a new company in Mumbai, out based out of Mumbai, in the uh, uh, budget space, budget and mid-market space, and launched a brand called Keys Hotels and Resorts. I was the founder for that business, the company and the brand. Uh, we managed to get a cracker of a team together. And uh, I think we did quite very well. Uh, I ran that for about eight and a half years. In 2000, uh, January of 2015, I joined Chalet Hotels yes. as the MD and CEO here. Uh, the intent was to come back into the luxury hotel space. I was missing the luxury hotel space. With that intent, I came here a year later, I exited my investment at uh, Bergen Hotels was the name of the company. Yes. Keys was brand. Uh, and since then, I've largely been here. I had a four month break over here too. Uh, that's when I went uh, as the Chief Operating Officer of ITC Hotels, mm -hmm. as an incumbent CEO at that point of time. But I came back yeah. uh, to Chalet Hotels to take the company public. Right. The idea was to come back, take it public in about 12 months time. And uh, exactly 12 months and seven days later, we were listed. So uh, this was in 2019, February of 2019, that we listed the company. And uh, four years later, five, four, five years later, we are amongst the second largest uh, hotel company in the country at enterprise value yeah. number. Yeah. How would you describe Chalet's uh, brand position in the market today? Mm -hmm. and, and why do you think that that is the correct segment to play in? So Krish, firstly, we are the uh, capex or capital intensive part of the hospitality industry. Uh, if you really look at our business, we, we own the assets. We build them and we own them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are the ones who put in the money. Uh, when people talk about the hospitality industry, uh, creating jobs, uh, creating uh, value for the state exchequers, uh, creating infrastructure uh, development, we are the ones who do that, right? Uh, so we own the hotels, the PNL is ours, the balance sheet is ours, the employees are on our roles. Um, we are the principal employers for all, pe all uh, third party workers also that work with us. Um, so, so it's all us in terms of the big picture item. From that perspective, I think clearly whether we are deciding where to build hotels, what design to build, what positioning to build, the core of it all mm. is our guests, mm -hmm. our employees, and the local community yeah. around there. So this, these three are, are of core essence to every decision that we take mm. when we invest in hospitality. We've been able to deliver industry-leading EBITDA numbers as an outcome, mm. right? Shareholder value creation, surely it's my fiduciary responsibility to deliver shareholder value. And therefore it will be always part of my up higher end of my, my, my mind space that it will occupy. Uh, but we do, the, the core of the business is still around this because we believe guests, like most other successful companies, our guests, our people, and the local communities is what, what is going to create value for our shareholders. It's fascinating that Chalet has gone down the path of being in a more capital intensive and asset heavy, um, you know, there's this constant debate, not just in, hospi uh, in hospitality, but in virtually every industry. And everyone loves talking about how asset light they are. Mm -hmm. And you've in many ways gone in the opposite direction. So could you talk about the trade off as you see it? Because obviously, the I mean, the way you see it, the pros outweigh the cons. Mm -hmm. So so why is it that Chalet has gone down this path versus the more asset-like model, where in many ways you would be, the brand would be Chalet versus say or Marriott or something like that? It started with the group, the DNA of the group, mm -hmm. the group itself in the business of development. And though if you look at the group today, all the, almost all the businesses but one are development, uh, developed to own or operate, mm -hmm. all right? So if you look at the group businesses today, whether it's shop or stock, it is an asset light, but uh, uh, an operating business. Mm -hmm. In orbit malls, they build to operate them. They don't build to sell. Uh, Mindspace Business Park, one of the leading REITs in India, mm -hmm. built to rent. Mm -hmm. There's no build to sell there. Mm -hmm. Chalet hotels, built to operate. Mm -hmm. So the DNA of the group is, whilst the, the strength is in development and the capability to develop efficiently mm -hmm. and just in time at the right locations, mm -hmm. uh, that's something that we bring on the table. But the intent is to keep them as operating businesses. The only business that the group in, is in, which is built to sell, is residential, mm. right? And they do that at the higher end. Uh, so that's one part of the business, side, side, the uh, genesis of where we are today. Uh, the second part is that we've been doing it for 20 years. The brands have been running out as for 20 years. They've been doing a great job at it, right? Uh, do we continuously evaluate where this, when is the right time, if at all, mm. for us to maybe launch our own brand, 
uh, as it is, we're running some of our tests, right? We've got the Duke's retreat that we run ourselves. The Four Point Sheraton is only a franchise, so we run it ourselves. The Hyatt Regency that we're building is only a franchise, we'll run it ourselves. The big hotel in Delhi that we're developing, which is going to be a Taj, we will run ourselves. It's only a franchise arrangement. So operations by us in any case. We might as well then think at some point of time of a brand. It's a constant debate. Um, I think that you're talking about the pros and cons. Let me give you uh, some of the cons of the capital intensive side of the business that we've taken. You don't get the flags of the space that the asset light brands can get, right? It's because the nature is capital intensive and there's a lead time to building uh, an asset. It takes slower, it is slower to put flags, but we're not in the business of putting flags in the country, across the country. We, we are creating value for the four stakeholders that we spoke about, and it does nothing to them by creating the flags. If I can partner with a brand who's creating the flags, we're very happy that they're creating the flags because then they're creating um, the network that our hotels need to do well. So we're happy to go down that route. Advantage on the other side. So we're not getting the scale and the uh, pan country presence that other, if you were asset type, we'd get. But on the benefit side, I think every hotel that we develop, the amount of EBITDA that it contributes, on the back of an agreed an investment, is quite phenomenal. Compare that with an asset right model. I'll give you a reference point now here. And this is just an example. An upper upscale hotel brand in India would, on just a pure fee basis, would earn between 90,000 rupees to one and a half lakh rupees per room per year. Okay. The You're talking about at, operate, uh, operating at the operator's level. level. Yeah. The management fee that they would earn. Now, Let's round it off to one leg just for the sake of uh, ease of calculation, right? Uh, so let's look at a 200 room hotel. So the fee is going to be two, two crores a year. There's some cost to running it. Okay, minus that off. You will end up with a certain number. So it's sub two crores is your contribution to the margin. Um, if I open a 200 room hotel, which I own, after paying off all the fees to the operators, etc., my beta number would be around say 60 crores, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so a sub two crore revenue, EBITDA to 60 crore EBITDA. Right. The, if I had a strategy that I wanted to grow on the back of only an asset light strategy, mm -hmm. only asset light, mm -hmm. from my current base of this year's expected EBITDA, it'll take me 15, 20 years to get there. Now you cannot allow a company to grow or doubling its EBITDA over a 15 year period. It just does not do service to the investors, right? You're not serving your investors in that case. So your asset light strategy, if at all, will align with what your aspirations are in terms of flags that you want across the nation or across the world. But your true revenue, your beta business growth is going to come out of a capital intensive business. And the fact that our beta margins are higher, the returns justify the investments that we do. If today I was getting returns on ROCs of say 4-5%, or mm -hmm. which is the same as a savings bank interest rate that you'd get, it does not justify it. Right. Then you're better off doing asset light. I want to understand things that you have learned over the years mm -hmm. and how Chalet goes about being as efficient as possible. Chris, we are a capital intensive and a people intensive business. right? And uh, our people cost is the highest wearable cost in our business. Mm -hmm. So if you don't keep them under control, you can go down under very quickly. Uh, we've learned this, uh, and I've been a hotelier at heart right 38 years in the hospitality business. Uh, and I've been an operator, for, or rather on the operating side of the business for majority of those years. I understand the, the challenges as well as the opportunities on that side. One of the things that I learned when I moved from hotel operations to being an entrepreneur at Keys Hotels, was how much of a difference it can make if you design your hotels well. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if you design your hotels with employee productivity in mind, you can make a tremendous difference uh, to your uh, employee to room ratios and therefore returns on investments. So, sorry, uh, could you give an example? I'll give an example. Yeah. If we look at the last few hotels that we opened, I'm gonna start with the one that opened just after I joined here. Mm -hmm. JW Marriott, a luxury hotel from a luxury brand. Mm -hmm. Our gross built-up area per room, leaving the basements out, mm. was about 1,100 square foot per room. In that same market, the competitors around range from 1,800 to 3,000 square foot per room. Now, what does it do for the business? Firstly, because you're building out 
we may get 10% efficient only in terms of cost per square foot that we build out because of the growth strength that we enjoy. Whether you're buying cement, steel, facade, air conditioning, whether you're doing it for malls, office buildings, or it's the same thing. But our scale allows us to buy it cheaper. That's one. But if we can get it cheaper and we can build less square footage for the same revenue base that we want to build or target, then we get a lot more efficient. So our competitors are between 1,800 to 3,000 square foot per room. We are at 1,100 per square foot per room. What have I done immediately? I've improved the de denominator dramatically for my return on capital employed. Okay. Now, when I reduce the area, the people required to run that area, maintain it, upkeep it, will also come down. Okay. Second thing that happened is my second largest cost is my utility cost. Because my gross built up area per room is far more efficient, not only my denominator, my numerator also improves dramatically because my operating costs come down. Correct. It doesn't mean that I'm reducing my uh, positioning. It's actually the JW Marriott, yeah. Yeah. right? It is actually the highest average room rate in that market today. Yeah. So if, if people are ready to fill up my hotel at a higher price mm. and they're really not aware that this hotel has been built a lot more efficiently than other hotels and it's run on far less employees than other hotels, mm. Why do I have to do any, the other, any other way? Yeah. I don't need to do it any other way. Yeah. Right? So therefore, our ROCs are higher. Mm -hmm. Our returns to capital to our shareholders are higher. Mm -hmm. My, because I'm building less square footage out, I'm able to project, com uh, complete projects in time and at a lesser cost. It's great hearing about design because that's, you know, it's one of the things that people don't realize the kind, the ways in which a company can gain an advantage, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's like from before you even started the project, you're setting yourself up for success. So I, I want to I want to know more about, for example, take take the average room in one of your projects. Let's say you're building today. Mm. In what ways would you say it's different from maybe the way you built a hotel room, say ten years back, for example? Do you are there marked differences that it may not be perceptible to the person staying in the room, mm -hmm. but you know, as the guy operating it, mm -hmm. it is maybe for instance, it's just the way it's designed. It's easier to clean, so the turnaround time is faster. It could be the decor, any of that. Like, what, what are some of the things? What are some of the ways in which room design has improved? Sure. So I think very good question. So let me uh, talk about uh, from an employee perspective to begin with, right? Uh, a typically a room takes about 20 minutes to 45 minutes to clean and turn it around. Mm -hmm. If it's a staying guest, then about 20 minutes. It can take anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes if it's a checkout guest. Uh, if you apply the, the work ergonomics of a housekeeping employee in the room mm -hmm. and map them to your designs that you decide for the room, it can make a tremendous difference number of surfaces to clean, number of different surfaces to clean, which means different equipment required. Uh, the amount of clutter or lack of clutter that you have in the room, the ability to move the bed up smoothly when they're making the bed, as against it taking two people to bring the bed forward, all that is going to impact your work productivity, okay. okay, and the turnaround time. So therefore, these are the things that go into the design when we look at it. From a guest perspective, I think what has changed over the last few years, Clearly, in-room entertainment, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi have become the need of the hour. It is literally as basic as water now. Um, what has changed is the writing desk concept is clearly going out of the window. Uh, most people prefer a nice lounger yeah. in the room instead of a writing desk because they work out of the, on, on their computers or iPads or whatever it is. And because they call laptops for a reason, uh, they, they're used in that fashion. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I see writing desks vanishing very quickly in the new designs that are coming up for us. I see TV screens becoming a uh, lot bigger. Mm. And because people value sense of space, the designs are done in such a fashion that you get this feeling of space. Mm. Therefore, the uh, sliding doors for your bathrooms to give you the sense of space, but gives you privacy when you want to close them, when you want to use them. So that option is there. Uh, so these are the sort of things that are coming to design. The other things that are coming in, making sure that they're acoustically sealed. People don't like sound coming into the rooms. They want the air conditioning to be effective but quiet. Mm. They want, when they pull the curtains, the room to have a dark effect, even if it's daytime. So blackouts are important. Um, the ability to use the lighting in an uncomplicated way. Sometimes you can go nuts trying to switch off some of those night lights, right? You must have a single master switch. Yeah. And you shouldn't have to run across and switch off a table lamp separately and then find the switch where that plug is. Uh, all the, the convenience part is so, ele so uh, elementary now to the design. The ability to charge your multiple gadgets in the room. 
mm. simultaneously within reach of your hand is also critical. Mm. Now, whilst you have multiple plugs at the writing desk earlier, now you need those ability, that ability by a bedside table. And not just the plug points, you probably need do two, both the types of uh, uh, USB ports now. Um, so all that's become critical. Mm. People are now migrating to uh, your uh, wireless charging systems on the, on the bedside tables. Uh, so all that's happening is changing, evolving very, very quickly. Yeah. The other thing that I think people have become very conscious about is the quality of the air in the room. So therefore, your HVAC system or the air, the air conditioning system has to be of the highest quality to be able to filter out the air properly, uh, induce fresh air from outside, in a tr treated fresh air from outside, so maintain fresh air component, um, and the ability to control the temperature and the draft is very critical. One of the pain points for many people is, some people don't like the draft, some people like a lot of draft, they should have the freedom to choose what they want. Uh, and that, therefore the direction of your unit is also critical from that perspective. Uh, carpets are going out of style for two reasons. Number one, they tend to attract uh, bacteria and germs. And whilst we clean them with vacuum cleaners every day, there's still a risk, you don't want to take that risk. So therefore hard flooring is becoming a lot stronger. We give small rugs now to compensate to do two things. Number three, one, feel soft under your feet when you get out of bed, right? You don't want a cold floor under on your foot when you get out. And number two, it absorbs sound. So all of that it works with. Uh, and then uh, uh, acoustically sealed walls between hotel rooms. You don't want to hear the television next door that's blasting over there in your room while you're trying to sleep. So these are quite several things, but these are all related to convenience, if you really look at them. It's not luxury that people are seeking, they're seeking basics and they're seeking convenience here. Right. And that's what we need to deliver as hoteliers. Have you thought about just not bothering to stock the minibar? Do people, do people really yeah. use it? So that's going uh, out of fashion very, very rapidly now. Yeah. Uh, two reasons, it of course, what stopped while the COVID was on just to reduce the interventions into the room. Uh, but I think more importantly, it's sort of uh, a wasteful exercise which doesn't add value to my guests, mm -hmm. but has a huge running cost. Mm -hmm. Extremely high running costs and spoilage because right. you know, they go, they, things keep lying there and then at the uh, when they're you know, best before use date, you've got to remove them. Yeah. And so therefore they, they get wasted very often. So it's it's quickly going on. So it'll be it'll largely be coming on request now. You know, ultimately all of this has to show up on your PNL, cash flow, mm -hmm. balance sheet, all of that. Mm -hmm. So how would, would you say that I mean how do you how do you judge that? That all these each of these in isolation seems small, mm -hmm. but in aggregate obviously add up to a lot. Sure. So how, how, how would you view changes to PNL as a result of all these changes? Look, a luxury is not about doing everything uh, that comes to your mind, because you might decide that, look, the best Italian marble is going to add a luxury quotient to my guest. Mm -hmm. A guest may not even notice it, right? Putting a very expensive um, artwork on the back wall of a reception uh, may, may sound very good to the designers or the builders of the hotels, or the owners of the hotel, but does the guest even realize that the guest that this painting is made by X, Y, Z, and there's so much of value to it, not realizing that probably a hundred bucks has gone up in the room rent because of the art, artwork behind the, the, the reception desk over there, yeah. right? Because that's, there's a cost to it, right, to everything. Yeah. Um, so we believe in uh, uh, working towards everything that the guest needs from an experience perspective. Mm. Uh, and anything that does not add value to the guests mm. or to my employees from a work quality of work perspective, we sort of leave out. Yeah. And that's our philosophy on how we build hotels. Uh, I think one of the reasons that we've been able to build them more efficiently than everyone else and by quite a margin is this philosophy. A, a lot of what you said is actually making the employees li life easier and more efficient. And obviously a large, given the number of people involved, um, both you know permanent as well as seasonal, you have to make sure that it's an environment everybody wants to show up and work in, right? Mm. So what have you learned over the years about creating a good environment, not only in an office environment, but also in a hotel when, when things can get really heated, right? You think of peak season, you can have really irrational customers as well. So mm -hmm. there's tremendous pressure coming from their end. And what have you learned about keeping employees happy in those sort of conditions? Uh, so look, uh, you're right, Chris, because if you look at the pyramid of a hot hotel log structure, it's the bottom most part of the pyramid that engages the most with the clients that you have in the hotel, right? And a lot of the clients come from very affluent backgrounds. So you've got the bottom of your pyramid engaging at, high, at constant level 
with very high profile guests in the hotel and therefore keeping them motivated besides of course training which is critical uh, is probably one of the top most priorities for the team that works at the hotel or the management that is running the hotel. Um, and I think at the first step to uh, motivation and employee morale is clearly respect and that's something a value that I really value truly. Uh, and I've learned this through experiences of my own. Um, and if you don't mind, I can share two examples here. Uh, they're interesting examples. Uh, when I was in industrial exposure training during my college days, mm -hmm. one of the first places that I went for my, it was a four week training program at the Machan restaurant and all day dining at uh, the Taj Mahal, Mansing Road in Delhi. And uh, as juniors at trainees, you were literally, you know, you were, you were cheap labor. Uh, and this is not about Taj, this is about all over the industry, right? Every industry. Uh, Taj is probably the better of, of, of everyone, better than everyone else. Um, so like every other trainee, I was wiping glasses at the back of the house for a couple of weeks. I wasn't allowed into the restaurant. Uh, I was not allowed into a restaurant. No? This, is, this yeah. is the level of uh, what a trainee does there. So my job was to, as the glasses got washed, wipe each of them. And because it was an extremely busy restaurant, the system there was, the process there was, you fill up the water glasses from inside, mm. carry them to the restaurant, as the guests seat, you put filled glasses on the table. It wasn't that, you know, you serve them water, etc. and that time. It was, just, it was a very busy coffee shop uh, called the Machai. And uh, so my job was to clean glasses, wipe the glasses, fill water, leave it on a salver or a tray there. Someone else would come take them inside. I wasn't allowed to take them inside all or so. And I did this for two weeks. I told my supervisor, that boss, I need to see the restaurant. <laughs> so he said, all right, from today you're promoted. You will now take the glasses inside, unload them and bring the dirties back, <laughs> right? Um, I was excited about it. I get to see the restaurant, I get to see the guests there. Uh, I'd only been there to those restaurants as a user, but as an employee, not done it. And we had this white shirt, black trouser, black tie, a black bow tie at that point of time as trainees. Uh, so I would do that, take the glasses, unload them on a side station, bring the empties back wipe, fill, take them, do the whole round again. And I did that for a few more days. I had a bit of an accident on my last day there. Um, but fortunately, the, my supervisor saw it wasn't my fault, so I didn't lose my job. But I, at that point of time, I thought this is the end of my hospitality career and I should look for something else. Uh, but to survive that. Yeah. At the end of my training, and they gave me some more exposure later on in the later part of my training. Um, you know, the managers, the restaurant managers, the assistant managers, we see, see, see them as icons. Mm -hmm. All right. And as a restaurant manager, he or she was still, you know, level five or level six in the org structure of that hotel alone. And we used to see them as icons. Uh, we had a restaurant manager called Bobby Saxena. I remember his name and I'll tell you why I remember his name. He had just moved in front of us to F&B. Um, that four week period, I did not get to speak to him at all. And he would walk past me and we'd all be at attention. That's how it used to be. Uh, on my last day in the morning, Bobby Saxena walks up to me and says, you're Sanjay, right? I said, yes, sir. Oh, well, you, today's the last day at work, uh, training, training? Yes, yes, sir. So have you made a report? Said, yes, sir. Can we go through it this afternoon? What time do you get off shift? I said, four o'clock, great. I'll see you at that table at four sharp. And I nervously went to the locker room just before I finished my shift, took out my report from there and went to this table and he insisted. I sit down, I said, no, fine, sir. He said, no, I'll take some time reading the report. So please do sit down and order something. What can we get you while I'm reading the report? Now, for me, it was a shocker that he asked me to sit on the table firstly, right? I had seen him as up there. Uh, he's just so humble. He went through my report. He asked all the right questions. It made me feel so important because I didn't expect this report to go anywhere but the dustbin, right? One copy goes to the hotel. One copy goes to my college. I knew the hotel copy should, would probably end up in the dustbin. Yeah. No one would see the light. Of, it won't see the light of the day. Uh, but he went through it. Yeah. What that taught me, and when we were done, you know, he thanked me for the time that I'd spent there. And from the collective collection box, the supervisor then brought an envelope, gave it to me, which was the only thing that I got out of the training. But you know what it taught me was that the junior most person, mm. the trainee over there, his or her opinion is also important to the organization. And that's what Bobby did that day. He actually picked the right points in my report, discussed them. If he hadn't, if I hadn't understood it, he explained it to me correctly. If he hadn't understood what I was trying to say, he would go deeper down and try to understand what I was trying to say. At some point of time, whatever he little bit he took away, you know, from that report, he would have implemented. Sure. Um, God bless his soul, he passed away. But he was my first lesson in good human resource management. Because mm -hmm. the motivation that came out of that, that experience there probably kept me in the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. Most people in hospitality industry, in fact, most people who leave the industry do so after the first industrial training exposure.
So this story I share with everyone in my hotels, everyone in the corporate office, that please take care of your IITs. So what I had started as a process when I was a general manager was every month I met the IITs in a locked room without any other person in the room, just the IITs and me. And I said, now open your heart out. Whatever you learned, you've come here to learn. What value have we added to you as, as an organization? But do you think they are they are okay telling the emperor that he's naked? Yeah, they would, they would say that. Especially the younger lot today is very, very candid about it. And you know, the fact that I had them locked in a room asking them what things are, how they have been treated and what, what value we're adding to you, the managers outside would make sure that they would be doing that during the tenure. Because right. the general manager is there, right, asking these things. This is, another, this is my second lesson in human resource management. All right? I was a general manager at Jaipur and uh, an executive director from the uh, corporate office had come visiting us. Mm. And he said, Sanjay, I haven't seen the Raj Vilas Hotel, which is an Oberon Hotel. Mm. Uh, can we go and take a look? So I called up the general manager. She said she's out of town, but her accommodation head or rooms division head would show us around. Mm. I, I kicked myself for the fact that I don't remember his name. I should have, right? But I went there and I'm gonna call him Abhishek because that's the vaguest, uh, the closest name I can remember. He met us as we walked in, like everything else at Oberoi's. Uh, meticulously done, you know, the show round was pre-planned, it was handled brilliantly by everyone. Every corner that we got into, some employee or someone got up, did namaste and wished us by our names, etc. Yeah. So they're that good at it. Yeah. And uh, they showed us the staff cafeteria, and in the staff cafeteria there's music blaring, Not no employee managing the cafeteria, spotlessly clean, food on the counter at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and he says we have 24-7 food available, something other than the same. When it gets over, the chef goes, replaces it with something else. But cleanliness of the cafeteria is maintained by the employees themselves. You use it, you clean it, you leave. Right? And there's a room with the music in it. You lock that door. You go and dance there and do your jig if you want to, just to unvent and come out if you want to do that. But that's not the story I want to get at. We come out, we're in the corridor of the hotel. And someone, you know, gently, softly speaks out, Abhishek, and he turns around, excuses himself from us. Now, here's the executive director of Taj. Mm -hmm. And the general manager of the hotel, he excused himself out there, went to that employee. Mm. We couldn't hear what they said, but I saw him giving a hug to him and come back. So out of curiosity, I asked, I said, Abhishek, uh, one of my colleagues in front of me, he says, no, no, he works in the kitchen stewarding department. Mm. Uh, he's going away for two weeks leave. I just wanted to make sure I wish him all the best for him and have a good holiday. Mm. Now, this tells you a lot about the culture of the organization and the value system of the manager who, we, who was showing us around. He thought it important enough to excuse himself from very senior people from the industry just to make sure he wished the person who was not in his department, right? Wish him all the best for his holiday that he's going for. He was not going to get married or okay. something else. He was just going for a holiday, yeah. his annual holiday to his place. That was my second les lesson in human resources, right? Know your people and take, make them feel important and care for them genuinely. And this was genuine care. It wasn't make, uh, you know, putting on something because he's not in the party, he, didn't care, he shouldn't have cared. Right. So these two examples and these two I, that is what I share with my team very often, I think have been the foundation of my human resource beliefs right. and my value systems on human resource. I, they've held me very well. A lesson I learned very early in my career, a lesson that I learned midway in my career. Uh, and the, I thought it's important to share this because I think this, this, they, there's value to be taken from this experience. So important, you know, like for example, it's, and I see it, honestly, unfortunately, I see it much more in India than anywhere else in the world. I mean, some of the guests are, I mean, they are just awful. Like, they are so rude to the staff, anyone they encounter in the mm. hotel. Like, I'll, I'll give you a basic thing, which is absolutely, I, I, don't, I don't know why, but it infuriates me. You go for a breakfast buffet. Mm -hmm. It's a buffet, right? You get up, you go take what you want, you come back to your table. And they will, you know, they'll start ordering as if it's a restaurant. And forget restaurant, they think they're sitting at home. Mm -hmm. And they're like, give me this juice, give me this, give me that. And, and I mean, these poor guys have to just go about and with a smile do all this. And, and, and the restaurants are not planned to handle that. Right? Exactly. It's, I mean, it's, it's a self-service, you know. It, I, but so, I mean, it, it's, it's remarkable that despite the scale, despite all the macro things that, you know, people like you have to take care of. That, that attention to detail that each employee, even though, like you said, on paper, he may be the lowest rung of employee doing, in, sometimes doing the most menial tasks. But, you know, you understand that it's a, it's a human, right? It's not a robot. Sure. They require that support from time to time in, in, in what is a very demanding business. So it, it's, I mean, it's great to hear that there are people who do actually, yeah, you know. See, we, as an industry, I think we, we do take care of our people. And we're very, it's a very close-knit industry. Yeah. Uh, we might be competitors. 
Uh, but if uh, today a fellow hotelier from a competing company is in trouble and needs help from any of us, mm -hmm. everyone step forward. Yeah. And I think that came to fore during the COVID. Yeah. I think the sort of integration of the industry that we saw and the uh, focus on getting business back jointly mm. on track mm. was quite outstanding. An important part of this is actually a project that you are heavily involved in called the Give Back Project. Um, could you could you explain what that is and, and what your you know desired outcome of that project is? So I started this Give Back Project uh, I think during COVID or just before COVID. Mm. Um, and during COVID obviously what happened was because we were saving on travel time and there was very little operations going on, clearly very little growth going on at that point of time. Uh, I did realize that at least on the weekends, I had sufficient time on mat. Mm. And the other thing that I realized, there was a lot of uh, colleagues from the industry who were going through difficult times, right? And they were either laid off or they were not getting their salaries or whatever situation they were going through. And there were health issues, etc. Or they were the frontline warriors I, I, working at hotels, taking care of the doctors, yeah. right? Or, or the people who were put in uh, isolation. Uh, so uh, all this I thought was creating a lot of mental uh, sort of distress on, on, these, on these people, young people. And I said, if there's any way I can at least counsel them, if someone wants to reach out, I would be happy to be their agony aunt. Mm -hmm. So that was the intent at that point of time. Uh, as it evolved uh, later on, I expanded this to young hospitality professionals who needed advice on their professional careers. It could be, you know, it could be a bad manager that you were, you're not having to able to handle, for example. Uh, or it could be a tricky solution of, of a guest, as you mentioned. Or, or it could be just a business plan that they were not getting their head around. Mm -hmm. at, but at a very personal level, right? right? right. Um, and then what happened, it evolved into a lot of entrepreneurs reaching out mm -hmm. and uh, seeking advice. Young entrepreneurs starting up whether it was F&B space or hotel space or even allied uh, tech, tech side of the hospitality space, uh, they started reaching out. And it's been very fulfilling because I think over the last couple of years, I would have had engagement with somewhere between 50 to 100 individuals or uh, partners who were starting off or investing in, in, business, in businesses. Uh, and on the... Uh, Investing in business advice, I think uh, average number of engagements I've had with each of them would, must be about to say anything from five to ten maybe. Uh, so hopefully I've added some value. Uh, if nothing else, I've at least uh, uh, so, sort of, uh, as I said, been a sounding board for them, uh, for their business plans, etc. Uh, so it's, it's been very fulfilling. So Sanjay, I want to end by again coming back to your own experiences. Mm -hmm over, like you said, it's now three and a half to four decades doing this. What are some of the more, I would say, are there examples or instances that, you know, have made you feel like this is why I go to work every day? I think a great question again. Um, look, along the 20 odd years that I spent in the operating side of the business, there were multiple uh, events that motivated me to go on. Uh, uh, guest feedback was clearly one of the big ticket items. I think employee feedback was equally strong. And then recognition from uh, my bosses, etc., always helped long. Uh, but there's nothing that, that works like success, right? Uh, every time you hit a small event of success, it sort of motivates to, for you to reach higher and get to a, a better space. And I'm not talking about personal better space, I'm talking about the business that I'd run. I've got a very, very clear value system. And the value system has got two things in it, one, three things in it. One, people are inherently good, right? How do you get the best out of them is your job. Uh, two is do the right thing, always. Three, do the right thing well. Mm -hmm. So these are the three things that I've always believed in, which has kept me motivated and enjoyed my work. But, uh, and I'm not gonna list down the recommendations, accolades, etc. I've got, we've got them. I mean, I personally got them from presidents of nations. Right? Uh, I don't put them in frames over here because, you know, those are gone. They're done. Someone else is now getting them. Uh, so whether it's presidents of US, UK, India, I've had all of those experiences uh, with letters written personally to me. Uh, but I think more, more rewarding were the people engagements. And I do want to give one example because I think it's a very moving example. It came out of my belief in people. 
I was uh, moved to, uh, I moved to Jaipur as a young man there. And that hotel at that time was about 17, 18 years old. And uh, people uh, generally liked the hotel so much they stayed. The attrition levels were very, very low. Maybe 20 years actually, beyond 20 years old at that time. And the hotel wasn't performing great within the Taj system. And we had divisions, so in the leisure system also, it wasn't one of the better performers of the team. Then I was sent there, listen, this is a hotel, it's a challenge. You left Taj for a year, we're calling you back, we want to put you there for you to turn that around. And uh, when that I realized that one of the things that was there was the work culture was very old, age old. And we needed to turn that around. And for people who've been working there for 20 years, it wasn't easy. It started off with me firstly insisting that I be called by my first name, but everyone was this a doorman. And in 1999, that wasn't the done thing, right? Uh, but in 1999, I was 34 years old. Uh, I was general manager of this lovely hotel, uh, a palace hotel. Um, every HOD in the department when I went to the morning meeting was older than me. Mm. Some of them 20 years older than me, even more, uh, more than that, some of them. Uh, so first thing I started was this. Now, not all of them were comfortable calling me Sanjay, especially the ones who were older, old, uh, old school people found it difficult. So I said, listen, I don't want it to become a hurdle to the communication. Yeah. Don't stop interacting, me because, <laughs> interacting with you because I insist that you call me Sanjay, but do try to see if we can look at that as, as, as an option sometime later, whenever you're comfortable with it. Yes. But you know, going down the uh, team in the first few months, I realized the hotel was segmented into top management, management, supervisors, and line staff. Mm -hmm. And it was segmented very clearly. There wasn't any aversion to it from anyone. Huh? It wasn't that the lower most part or the lowest more rung of the hierarchy of the organization did not like the fact that the managers and supervisors did not engage with them. But I realized that that was a disabler for growth and improvement. Because then things will go, if we don't change that, things will continue to be the way they were earlier. And if I wanted to make a material change in the way this hotel performed, I had to change that work culture around. Uh, and I said there was a huge amount of knowledge sitting with people who have been here for 20 years. How do we capture that knowledge? So we started a program, uh, I called it the uh, ladies and gentlemen lunch. Ladies and gentlemen part I picked, it wasn't from someone else, some other brand. Uh, but this whole concept of this lunch was very unique. And I said each of us, with this top management, next com as we were, would every week once invite three employees okay. for lunch at our restaurant. Okay. Those employees would get an opportunity to go to their locker rooms, get into CVs, enter the restaurant like every other guest does from the front door, be greeted by the host, whether it was me or one of the uh, heads of the department, seated, take them through a proper lunch mm. with individual ordering, no buffets, mm. give them the pleasure of deciding what they want to eat. And if they feel an uncomfortable ordering because they're not used to doing it, mm. let the host be the lead so they emulate and copy. Okay. Similarly with table etiquettes. Let the, you don't make them out, don't tell them that this is how you handle it. You just do what needs to be done, they'll follow, right, if required. Like if you want to put on the survey, then put it in a lap, let them follow you to see it so that they are comfortable about it, they are not being told about it. And during this work lunch, or this lunch, all you need to focus on is about them and their families. The conversation is all going to be about them and their families. What is the son doing? What does he aspire to do? What's the wife doing? She's looking at work, coming and working with her. What's the husband doing? You know, can they, if we look at them as potential associates in our, in, in our business, all that conversation would happen. The only work takeaway that used to be there at the end of it would be what's the suggestion for the hotel? Mm. Well, how can we improve this? Now, and then the manager, the host, had to put in a report which got discussed in the morning meeting. Mm. And the action plan from that report, which means you actually picked up points that they gave as suggestions, or it could be just a personal issue. My son's exams are going to start three months from now. Put uh, this thing that before the son's exam start, a note goes to the person. Okay. All right? They feel very good about it. Actually, this was held very form formally. Huh? The invitation went on paper, on a okay. printout. Okay. Yeah. Dear Someone, Krish, yeah. you know, I'd love to have you over lunch at 1 p.m. at a so-and-so restaurant. Now, this is going to the security guard or the okay. kitchen cleaners yeah. and all of that like yeah. that. When the lunch is done, <coughs> individual notes went to all the three guests. Saying, lovely joining you for lunch. So yeah. glad that your son's doing so well in school. Found you this suggestion extremely interesting. I will take it up with the top management. Mm -hmm. So then that action point was built from those suggestions. They were worked upon, and the next town hall, they were presented what we've achieved, what we've been able to roll out from those action points. 
Okay. This was my intent. Mm. It worked very well. It worked better than I expected. <clears throat> but one afternoon, when I was walking through the restaurant, I saw our executive housekeeper, Watsla. She was hosting three people. And this was started with the lowest ticket number. So the oldest people started off this with this first. And we had a six foot six inch security guard with this big mush uh, sitting at the table. And he was sobbing. Now, I didn't want to interrupt the lunch. I walked. I sort of did what I had to do. But after lunch, I called Watsla. I said, Watsla, what happened? Why was he crying? She says, he, for 20 years, he's been opening the car doors, mm -hmm. wishing the guests, shutting the car doors, and then again receiving them as they leave and wishing them all the best. Mm -hmm. He says, I never expected to see the in inside of a restaurant. Now, for me, that one event mm -hmm. was a complete success of this program. We didn't need anything more out of it. But that LNG lunch was so successful, it got rolled out across the leisure division after that in every hotel of, of the Leisure Division of Thatch at that point in time, and became one of the single most employee morale boosters mm -hmm. and integrators of organization, of teams within the hotel, mm -hmm. uh, as a one single initiative that caused, caused it more, to happen most, uh, not the best way to do go around doing it. Yeah. So the reason I'm sharing this is mm -hmm. because some of, these, some of these small initiatives can make changes to the work culture, which can be, shift the business momentum to a completely different level. Mm -hmm. Now, the outcome, very important to know the outcome. This hotel was amongst the, there were 25 water hotels in the leisure division, amongst the last five when we went there. One year later, at the annual awards of the leisure division, 18 awards were given out. We won 17 out of those 18 awards. This included business performance, profits, guest satisfaction, forget employee satisfaction, that was achieved through all of these interventions that we had. But we won 17 out of 18 awards as the best hotel in the division. Uh, so these, uh, these things can be so important on the turn for turning around businesses. It's these small things that, you know, at a very ground level, like you said, just show someone the respect he or she deserves. And, and you know, that can make all the difference, right? It, it, like you said, you gave that example of, um, of the gentleman who, I mean, after 20 years, he took, it took him 20 years to take one step into the restaurant, you know, it's... They don't have lunch over there. I mean, it, it, and he was this, yeah, he must be about 58, 59 years old, big white moustache, sitting there, six foot six inches tall, and he's sobbing. Fantastic, it was absolutely wonderful hearing about your own journey and everything that's happening at Chalet. And, and I wish you and Chalet all the best and Thank hopefully you, we'll Krish. connect soon again. Thank you, look forward. Thank Cheers. you.